Shalom Aleichem, my dear brothers and sisters. Today I would like to talk to you about the accuracy of the Torah. Now when I say the Torah, by the way, I mean a real Torah, or sometimes we refer to it as the Torah scroll. What do, what do I mean by that? So for example, when we learn the Torah, we don't necessarily learn it from the scroll. We learn it from like a textbook which has, you know, the Torah itself, which has sometimes the translation to English or other languages, which has the com commentaries, which has um, even inside the Torah text itself, it has the uh, dots which, which um, tell us how to pronounce the vowels. You know, as you maybe heard that Hebrew language does not have vowels, the writing itself the pronunciation of the vowels is uh, purely comes from tradition so in about the 10th century somebody decided to in order to preserve the tradition to set up a system where they would add the dots and certain dots within the certain letters would tell us how to pronounce that letter correctly so for example you know there is a letter let's say letter called um, shin so if the shin has a line under it, under it, it would be pronounced as sha. If it has, for example, three dots underneath, it would be pronounced as she. But the letter itself is just sh, you know, with, without any vowel. So anyway, so, so these, all these things are in the, what we call the humash, or probably the best way to translate that would be like the textbook of the Torah. Now, what I'm talking about here is the real Torah scroll. Now, the real Torah scroll, it's located usually in the synagogues, and it's written on a real parchment, meaning it's a, it's a re real skin of an animal. And it has to be a kosher animal skin, and the person preparing the skin has to prepare it for the sake of a Torah scroll. So, for example, let's say he... You know prepared the skin he was thinking to use it for a couch let's say right a leather couch and then he did it and then he decided oh might as well maybe use this for a torah scroll this would invalidate that skin so the skin has to be prepared for the sake of the torah scroll so now the person writing the torah on that skin he has to write it with hand you know meaning it cannot be printed and he cannot add anything to the text itself. He has to copy it directly from the previous text. He cannot do it by memory. And even if he knows it by memory, the whole thing by heart, he's not allowed to write it uh, from memory. He has to read each letter and each word from the previous text and copy it. And when he copies it, he has to pronounce the word that he's copying. And if he was to add, to the text itself, for example, the vowels, like those dots that I was talking about, that would invalidate the Torah scroll, meaning this Torah is invalid. It's not a kosher Torah, meaning that it cannot be used for us to fulfill our commandment of, of reading the Torah on certain holidays, on the Sabbath, and on Mondays and Thursdays. That's when we read the Torah in the synagogue. And so, if he was to change even the ink color, so for example, the Torah has to be written in black ink. If a person decides to, for whatever reason, you know, I like blue better, or red, or pink, whatever, and he decides to do this, this makes the Torah invalid again. It has to be black ink on the parchment. Another, um, uh, uh, another law we have is that the letters themselves have to be completely separated so for example if there are two letters that are touching each other meaning there's no white space between them the whole torah scroll again is invalid another example is for uh, if let's say the torah scroll is um, you know it's old it gets old sometimes and uh, the letters are you know begin to deteriorate the ink begins begins to deteriorate and certain letters might you know the ink might fall off or something somewhat not so if a letter became you know to such an extent that it's unrecognizable to a child i mean a child cannot 
tell for sure what leather this is because it may look like a different leather if it's you know something a little piece you know gets erased somehow so in that case also the Torah scroll is invalid meaning each letter has to be clearly visible and easily understood even by a child so again let me repeat if a Torah scroll has anything added to it whether the vowels which were not in the original text or the different uh, color of the ink or you know the letters are touching or even one thing I forgot to mention there's there has to be a certain white space on the top and on the bottom a certain amount of white space uh, on the top of the text and on the bottom of the text if that is not there that also makes the Torah scroll invalid so the the copying of the Torah scroll is really a big big work and hard work and it's you know takes a sofer the person who's writing the Torah scroll a long time and um, here on the screen I'm gonna show you what the text of the real Torah scroll looks like here as you can see on the screen and you know even though it, it looks so beautiful and it looks so beautiful that it seems like it's printed but no this is actually written by hand you know this is what it looks like when it's written by hand and um, so I hope this uh, kind of explains to you what a real Torah scroll now again everything else where we have those study guides which have the translations and all that those are not real Torah scrolls they're not kosher for us to fulfill our obligation and um, now what happens when the Torah scroll gets old which cannot be used anymore right like I said if a Torah scroll gets becomes you know unusable so we're not allowed to burn it or or uh, to you know throw it in the garbage the only thing we can do is store it somewhere and just you know just don't use it store it in a maybe a warehouse that's by the way what uh, a lot of the ancient manuscripts were discovered in these type of storehouses they're in Hebrew they're called Gniza so for example there's the Cairo Gniza which was like you know I think like 1000 something years old maybe older where all these different um, scrolls and different religious texts were kept you know just because we are not allowed to to um, you know to dispose of them and by the way another way one can dispose of a, a kosher Torah scroll is to bury it together uh, bury it in the ground preferably together with a righteous person so when a righteous person t passes away it's preferable to bury that scroll together with him and to bury it it's preferred I think to do it in a non um, waterproof some kind of a waterproof container so that doesn't you know get muddy and this gets disrespected somehow under the ground um, and now what about the accuracy the consistency between the all the Torahs that we have now when I talk about the consistencies I'm talking about the Jewish Torahs because I'm not talking about the Christians you know they have their own Bible and they have the translation and then they have the Greek you know so our Torah scroll does not necessarily I don't think I'm not sure actually but it might not always match with their uh, manuscripts and I'm not talking about the Samaritans you know they also have their uh, own text uh, which is in a different script than the Jewish but when looking purely at the Jewish Torah scroll doesn't matter which Jew, Jews whether Jews from Yemen Jews from Morocco Jews from Europe Jews from China all the Jews have the same exact Torah scroll and when I say same exact I mean same exact that they're you know the same exact text all the words are the same with no vowels again you know because our Torahs do not have any vowels so there are no vowels um, all the words are the same or the, all the sentences are the same the number of verses are the same however truth must be told that there are nine letter differences between the Yemenite Torahs and the rest of the Jewry meaning the uh, European Jews or the Moroccan Jews so there are nine letters that are different in all these nine words I think only in one word the pronunciation changes which does not change any of the meaning but there are 
uh, nine words which have one letter difference between the text so you know this is unfortunate somehow you know and the truth is we don't know which one is the more accurate you know they, the Yemeni Jews have their tradition the other Jews have their traditions they rely on their tradition the Yemeni Jews rely on their tradition and um, so that's why you know but I personally think that the Yemeni Jews since the community has been cut off for many years I personally think that it might probably more likely that their ones is uh, the non-accurate one but I could be wrong and that's why um, it is recommended when we go to a synagogue to go to a synagogue that is within your tradition so that um, because once again if even if one letter is different in a Torah scroll that would invalidate the Torah even if it's a letter that does not even make a sound you know there are cert certain letters in Hebrew that do not make a sound at all so but even if that there is a letter missing or it's different or it's not there or a, a substitute letter is instead of it that makes the whole Torah scroll invalid and so therefore it is recommended for a Jew to go to a synagogue especially on those days Mondays Thursdays and Saturdays to the synagogue within his own tradition why because if he's going to a synagogue let's say he, uh, you know to it's recommended I mean, I'm not, it's not required but it's recommended because if he's going to a synagogue that follows a different tradition let's say a European Jew goes to a Yemenite synagogue or vice versa that means he's reading from a Torah scroll which according to his tradition is invalid okay so I hope that kind of answers the question um, about the you know the accuracy of our Torahs and what exactly is a Torah scroll thank you for watching